Welcome to the American Planning Association podcast. This episode kicks off our series that looks at how different communities prepared for and responded to natural hazards such as floods, wildfires, hurricanes, and more. How have planners in these communities promoted resilience in their hazard mitigation and disaster recovery planning? We'll find out on this episode of Resilience Roundtable, brought to you in conjunction with the American Planning Association's Hazard Mitigation and Disaster Recovery Planning Division. I'm your host, Rich Roths. I'm a part-time senior hazard planner for Burton Planning Service of Columbus, Ohio, and previously a principal planner with URS AECOM Corporation. Before that, I was a senior planner for FEMA Region 5, where I was in charge of coordinating all mitigation planning activities for the six states in the region. I'm also a proud member of the American Planning Association's Hazard Mitigation and Disaster Recovery Planning Division. Our guest today is John Henneberger. John is one of Texas's leading experts on low-income housing issues, a nationally renowned advocate for fair and affordable housing, and a 2014 MacArthur Fellow. In his 40 years in housing and community development, he has helped grassroots community groups advance their own model solutions to housing issues in their communities and forge common ground policies from diverse housing interests. John is co-director of Texas Housers, a nonprofit that advocates for equitable and just disaster recovery policy and practices. John, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you very much. John, can you tell us about your background? What got you into the field of hazard mitigation and disaster recovery planning? Uh, My real background is in affordable housing and community development. I've worked for 40 some odd years on um, issues of uh, housing for low-income people and the trying to improve the physical conditions of low-income neighborhoods. I, I got into that work as an undergraduate uh, at the University of Texas at Austin and uh, worked with as a volunteer in community organizations in low-income African-American neighborhoods, which were facing uh, combined problems of uh, freeways being built through them and neglect of public infrastructure and in another case an urban renewal area that uh, the promise to rebuild had never occurred. My involvement in disaster recovery kind of came about post-Katrina and with the uh, follow-on of Hurricane Rita after that which hit the uh, southeast Texas Gulf Coast and um, I was made quickly aware of the fact that the impact of these natural disasters has a tendency to be uh, felt most strongly in low-income neighborhoods of color, the type of neighborhoods I had been working on to try to secure uh, more decent, affordable housing and uh, adequate public infrastructure and neighborhood protection and the like. And uh, so that's, I guess you'd say I sort of... uh, got into disaster recovery because the disasters seemed to be affecting the neighborhoods that I cared about um, a whole lot uh, starting in uh, around 2008. And we've had a whole series of disasters hit Texas in the subsequent years. And it's like we're never not recovering from a disaster these days in Texas. And climate change is really, uh, has really, uh, made these disasters even more frequent and more severely felt, and uh, no more severely felt than, again, in um, these low-income neighborhoods of color, which have a tendency to be in the physically most vulnerable uh, locations where disasters seem to strike. I totally agree. Uh, Can you describe what your current position is? Well, I'm the co-director of a nonprofit organization uh, that was founded in 1988. It's uh, called Texas Housers, and we work on the same things I started working on back about 40 years ago. It's the issues of um, ensuring that there's uh, housing justice for low-income people, that uh, everyone should have access to decent, affordable homes 
in a in a quality neighborhood of their choice. So we work on um, the issues of housing affordability. We work on uh, looking at government efforts to develop housing and the systems that government has in place to make housing assistance av- available. We're sort of um, a policy uh, practice combination organization. Uh, generally, we associate ourselves with uh, organized groups of low-income people, uh, sometimes at a citywide level and other times at a neighborhood level, who are trying to take on uh, the problems of uh, of housing. And uh, we've expanded over the years to focus a lot on issues of uh, public infrastructure and um, I guess you'd say social infrastructure uh, within neighborhoods as well. Am I correct in assuming that you would also get involved more on a uh, state and national level on environmental justice is- issues for grants? Yeah, we, uh, we, we do work on a number of uh, environmental justice issues, uh, the, you know, both at the local community level. We've been doing some work around uh, a Superfund project in the, on the Texas-Mexico border in uh, Hidalgo County, we've worked on some uh, related projects of chemical spills uh, on industrial sites in uh, low-income neighborhood in Houston, worked on um, problems of the um, blight caused by refineries that abut uh, low-income neighborhoods in Corpus Christi and, and Beaumont, Port Arthur, and, and other areas. We don't do so much uh, work on a national level. We pretty much concentrate on on issues where there are local partners. Our, our sort of philosophy of, of change, if you will, is that r- the real solutions to problems that affect uh, the communities that we work in have to be advocated for and won by uh, citizens who are civically engaged at the uh, community level to take on these issues. And we see ourselves as basically um, sort of a staff resource to citizens who perceive a problem and want to take it on. Uh, And most of our work is at a fairly micro level, although these uh, large-scale disasters like Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Ike, Hurricane Dolly, and now Hurricane Harvey, um, those affect multiple counties. And so we we have been fairly active at the those those are programs that are administered through the governor's office uh and so we've been pretty active in looking at the the policies that are implemented on the state and the regional level around disaster recovery can you i realize that you don't deal with a specific community but can you give us a kind of a snapshot pre-Harvey of some of the uh, communities that you are dealing with and have dealt with, and then also go into the impact of Harvey on the communities? Sure. Um, Let me give you a couple of of examples at the local level. In, um, In the Houston area, Houston was one of the epicenters of the impact of Hurricane Harvey. It was essentially a flood event there. Um, We've been working for, uh, I guess, about seven, eight years with a group of uh, African-American and Hispanic uh, grassroots low-income leaders in Houston uh, through the Texas Organizing Project. It's a a citywide organizing group of people who are fighting for uh, economic justice and housing justice and neighborhood justice. And the, a number of these neighborhoods, as, as I was saying earlier, are in uh, low-lying areas. A lot of them are affected because upstream areas flooded heavily, and the bayous that carry the water from those neighborhoods through the low-income neighborhoods of color um, overflowed and um, caused widespread flooding uh, it isn't the first time some of these neighborhoods had flooded. Many of them had flooded under Tropical Storm Allison and uh, Hurricane Ike, but um, a number of them uh, flooded more severely than they had ever before. Uh, by and large, uh, these neighborhoods 
um, lack any sort of engineered stormwater protection. They have open ditch drainage. They do not have storm sewers. Um, the uh, conveyances, the bayous, are the major conveyances for water for the entire county, and they flow from generally from the western part of the county, uh, where the incomes are higher and the housing densities are are lower through these low-income neighborhoods of color, which are older neighborhoods, more inner-city neighborhoods, and then into the um, into the bay. The bayous overflowed and uh, people's houses flooded to an extreme degree. And there were environmental consequences to this. Uh, one Superfund site in particular, which we had been working on in the 5th Ward in Houston, uh, was flooded, and uh, it was a creosote, old creosote site with a railroad, and those contaminants flowed into the surrounding neighborhoods. And yeah, it was uh, you know the, Harvey was was a a major disaster in in these neighborhoods, which are completely inequipped um, by virtue of the fact that they've essentially been publicly redlined from even basic infrastructure. So the results were were catastrophic. Did uh, the homeowners have flood insurance by chance? Very, very few homeowners had flood insurance. Um, We're talking about uh, areas where uh, generally the poverty rate is somewhere between 40 and 80 percent in the census tracts. Um, A lot of people didn't even have homeowners insurance. Um, These are older neighborhoods. Uh, many of the properties have have uh, been passed down over generations. The, there's been there's a number of households have had uh, deferred maintenance issues on their homes because of their low incomes. Uh, insurance is uh, isn't the top priority when you're living at the poverty level and trying to pay the taxes and the upkeep on the house and deal with transportation costs, which are huge in Houston because of the lack of, of very robust public infrastructure, uh, public transportation infrastructure. That, that sounds uh, very similar to the issues in the Lower Ninth Ward in uh, New Orleans after Katrina. I know I was uh, in New Orleans post-Katrina for the American Planning Association, and we saw those same issues. I, I think that um, the uh, we, we always always remark after every disaster that Many of the neighborhoods that uh, we work in have almost identical characteristics that we've seen in uh, the Lower Ninth after Katrina. The uh, the aging housing stock, the public infrastructure that just is either non-existent or hugely inadequate, um, often the failure of public infrastructure. Uh, we had a subsequent disaster to Harvey down in the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas, right on the uh, border with Mexico, where informal settlements outside of the major metropolitan areas are occupied by um, immigrants and farm workers and very low-income people. Again, the, uh, the water conveyances, the main drains, if you will, that carry the water out of the urban areas run adjacent to many of these informal settlements. And uh, we had levee failures in that uh, instance that heavy rain event down there uh, about three months ago, and we had levee breaches that um, caused widespread structure flooding. It's eerily similar to uh, you know the failure on the Mr. Go Canal and uh, and the other things which devastated the low-income neighborhoods in New Orleans. These these patterns of public neglect combined with these climate change events have really just repeatedly devastate uh, low-income people's communities. Yes, uh, they do, uh, unfortunately, and we see it again and again. Are you aware of whether Houston or Harris County or any of the other counties and communities you were dealing with had either approved response plans or annexes to plans or approved mitigation plans? Well, in some cases, uh, you know, I, I'm not certain what the formality of the of the mitigation plans 
are the Harris County Flood Control District has been uh, doing some uh, some buyouts and done some uh, impoundment areas and the like to try to improve uh, drainage prior to Hurricane Harvey. Um, it was it was obviously insufficient to be able to address the problems. Very obviously, they need a lot more work post Hurricane Harvey. Uh, yeah, and the um, I'd say the w- one of the things that sort of you know concerns me is uh, there's a there's an equity question. There's obviously an equity issue about why we're at the stage we were at the time of the last disaster. You know, why is it that the bayous overflowed? Why is it that there was no engineered stormwater collection system to get the water out of the neighborhoods and the like? I think the uh, the current equity question is uh, Texas has received approximately $10 billion of CDBG disaster recovery funds from the federal government. And, um, you know, the current concern is what is going to be the the use of those funds? Are those funds going to actually address the communities which had essentially no infrastructure, or are they going to go for areas that, uh, for buyouts and reimbursements to homeowners in higher income areas that flooded? Obviously, the situation which existed at the time of the disaster was built on years of conscious public disinvestment of public funds in it from infrastructure in the low-income neighborhoods of color, in the poor neighborhoods in Houston. And, you know, there really isn't any evidence to suggest that, um, that the local governments, the county government, the state government, have re- are really going to prioritize the use of these new disaster recovery funds to address the, uh, retroactively the absence of, of, of infrastructure in these areas. Actually, there's quite a bit of evidence to the contrary. In Houston, the city council just adopted a, uh, a requirement requiring that homes that are uh, rehabilitated above a certain value and new homes constructed are elevated to two feet above the 500-year base flood elevation out of the 500-year floodplain. And while that's that's in theory a uh, a positive thing, we are concerned that that what's going on is really sort of a uh, burden shifting exercise, if you will. That what what is happening is that the low income neighborhoods, the people are going to lack the financial resources to do that elevation. These are areas where no new housing, no new businesses had, were being built prior to the disaster because of the high poverty rates and the lack of public infrastructure to begin with. And, uh, you know, to the extent that the city looks to individuals to elevate as a solution as opposed to addressing the restoration of basic or the first-time provision of basic public flood control infrastructure in low-income neighborhoods, uh, to us represents this thing I call sort of a burden-shifting approach to disaster recovery, where you, where government tries to uh, say to individual homeowners, you're responsible for making sure that you don't flood again. And um, I think the result is going to be that uh, basically a lot of people will not be able to afford to elevate and we'll see repetitive flooding in these areas as a result. John, could you explain how your organization is working then to uh, change the status quo in Houston and Harris County to get more funds into those low-income housing areas? Well, um, we did a um, lessons learned document that's on our website at texashousers.org, which is uh, basically a summary of four rights that we think government ought to extend to all the people who are affected by the recovery process, seven principles for recovery, and then we have 60 programmatic initiatives based on our experience with previous disasters about programmatic approaches to dealing with the problem. So we've taken it at that kind of high level about saying, here are the principles 
the rights, the lessons learned. And then we also work with individual neighborhood associations that were affected and the leaders in those neighborhoods. And we serve as their research staff and their policy researchers and their uh, data researchers. We have a uh, we have a research team, a GIS team, that um, has spent a lot of time uh, trying to obtain FEMA individual damage assessment report data out of FEMA. FEMA has been not as transparent and free to share that information as we would like, but we have an analyzed the data that we've been able to get to determine who was affected by the disasters so that we are able to try to monitor that the funds that the state is dividing up are allocated appropriately and fairly on a geographic basis. Ike was a it was 52 counties were affected, and so the, the geographic allocation of the funds is important. And then we're also interested in the question of income-wise, who was affected by these disasters within these geographies, and then beyond that, what is the ethnic and racial profile of the individuals, what percentage of the population are disabled. So what we do is we try to monitor where the funds are going and look for questions of equity around the allocation of the funds. Are the, are the funds flowing into the areas that actually had uh, loss? And more than that, are the funds flowing into the areas that have unmet need? Because if the funds just flowed based on loss, then that wouldn't be the, an equitable way to distribute the funds because there are a number of individuals who have insurance proceeds and the like that are going to make them whole. We have to look at the unmet needs and to see whether the funds flow equitably there. So we look at the policy issues from a planning side. We look at, uh, we try to monitor where the damage was and where the funds are flowing. And then at the micro level, we work with neighborhood and community leaders to basically understand how individuals and neighborhoods are being affected by the process and then to help them to have the information tools and the data tools to be able to advocate for uh, an equitable recovery for themselves. Out of all of these, can you come up with one item that you're particularly proud of from your post-Harvey work? I know there is a lot of them sound very, uh, things that we would really like to see happen, but anything you're particularly proud of? Well, I'm an advocate, so I'm, I'm mostly focused on things that are still going wrong we're trying to fix. Uh, and I have to say that the state's response to the Harvey disaster does not indicate that it has learned very much from previous disasters. I think there's a lot of dysfunction in the uh, state and local governments in terms of the design of programs, the allocation of funds, and the like. And the alarm bells are going off here in our office when we look at the data and we look at how the, how the programs are operating. And, and when we talk to people at the neighborhood level and we look at the type of temporary repairs being done to homes, um, you know, I don't want to paint a, uh, I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture to say there's there's some great shining light in the middle of this. I actually think that this recovery is going every bit as inefficiently and as inequitably as the previous uh, disaster recoveries have have gone. Um, we have spent on on the positive side, and it is very small positive. On we have spent a considerable amount of effort trying to develop an alternative to the, uh, the process that uh, the state of Texas and most of the local governments use here to do rebuilding owner-occupied homes post-disaster. Um, we've lived pretty closely with these programs over the last 10 or 12 years uh, as the state you know, essentially brings in private contractors, spends $150,000 a unit to put a replacement house on the ground which is a sort of a cookie cutter, non-architecturally designed, no local context to the design structure to replace the homes of a lucky subset 
of uh, disaster survivors. I say a lucky subset because the funds that are available are inadequate to rebuild all of the houses. So in essence, it's a uh, it's a small proportion of the number of people who are eligible, low income, and need a house who actually get it because of the various cost inefficiencies and the like. There's also this delay built into rebuilding. It, it was it was over eight years after Ike before the last homes were completed, uh, the last owner-occupied homes were completed in terms of rebuilding in Texas, which is just way, way, way too long. Um, we've spent a lot of time with uh, some friends of ours who are architects and uh, some friends of ours who are community development corporations trying to design an alternative rapid rebuild program that we call RAPIDO, R-A-P-I-D-O, There's information about that program on a website, rapidohousing.org. And uh, essentially what it is, it's a uh, modular panelized unit where the the wall units are fabricated off-site and then brought onto site. Uh, They're stood up and a core house is built, which is uh, larger than a traditional FEMA temporary housing trailer unit. That costs somewhere between twenty-five and twenty-eight thousand dollars to deploy. The the FEMA trailers are running about seventy-five thousand, and our our idea was to capture the value or the the money that was being spent by FEMA on the temporary housing unit and use it to build this core, and then the rest of the house, a completed house, is built around the core as the family lives in it. So in in essence, instead of parking a FEMA trailer in the front yard and having people live in it while they're waiting around for the $150,000 of CDBG money to eventually come around or not, and then the house gets built and then the FEMA trailer gets hauled off and sold off surplus, we're putting people into a permanent core of the house that they will occupy permanently and then building the rest of it around it and capturing the FEMA money so as to be able to build rebuild more homes. And um, we, did, we did 20 of those units as a demonstration in the Rio Grande Valley after Hurricane Dolly, and we currently have one that we've privately fundraised. And the family moved in uh, in September uh, to the temporary core, so we are you know, we are sort of testing this model. We're trying to perfect it. We think there's no one silver bullet in disaster rebuilding, but um, there are, uh, it takes too long to rebuild under existing systems. It costs too much, and we never seem to learn the lessons from one disaster to the next. So we're trying to, to cure those three problems. It sounds also like you're sidestepping one issue uh, after major disasters of with the, you mentioned the FEMA trailers with the issue of people complaining because the FEMA trailers never leave so by yeah. beginning yeah. to build a house that can be expanded on you've sidestepped that issue completely right and you give the individuals who live in the house some agency you know there's an architect assigned to each house and the the family works you know, the core is the core. It's an interior part of the house that's uh, a bathroom, a temporary wall kitchen, a living area, and a bedroom. And so, but you, as you build the rest of the house around the house, you can customize the house and use the historical context and the architectural context of the neighborhood and actually have the house not appear to be a cookie cutter, quote, disaster house. But, you know, you can actually rebuild to whatever the vernacular is of the neighborhood in which the the house is built. And the individual homeowner has some agency in making choices about design and uh, floor plan and other things like that. And I've come to see, having worked with a lot of disaster survivors, that one of the most devastating parts of the disaster, there's, there's the economic and the social aspect of the thing, but it's the it's the loss of agency, the loss of power, the loss of control over your life that um, is also a compounding part of the disaster. And if you can be engaged in the rebuilding and have some role 
in the home design in and even perhaps in standing up the wall units of the core and being part of the build as it um, as as your home gets rebuilt certainly part of the design and the like that is part of the healing process that really needs to take place for disaster survivors and and i would assume that uh, each of the houses then too can meet the individual needs of the various homeowners so you're not going to get that cookie cutter effect right uh, exactly the um the the family that was just uh, the core was just built in Houston this is a woman with a severely disabled son who is uh, wheelchair bound and requires a, um, a specially equipped ADA uh, shower and bathroom and special design for the bedroom to permit egress uh, in case of fire and the like and a specialized hospital bed. And so you literally have to understand that every family's need is to some degree different. This family's need was, to a significant degree, uh, very specialized. And, um, you know, that, again, is part of helping people recover, is to recognize the special needs of, uh, of the families. And also to blend ADA in with the various post-disaster requirements of, say, elevating a structure. Right. Yeah, the the ramping of the structure is obviously hugely important in the case of of ADA units, but in all the units, it's our belief that every unit should have a no-step entrance and that every unit should be two feet or 30 inches, actually, above the estimated highest flood elevation that the the, the lot could be subject to. So we've got some pretty good-sized ramps on some of these houses, but having... Um, recognizing that homes are for life and they're often for many different families. And so we believe in uh, universal visitability as an absolute requirement if government money touches the structure. One question that I have, APA is getting into more of providing assistance. We have have our community uh, planning assistance teams that have gone out to several communities and now APA is seeking uh, volunteers post-disaster to assist communities. Did you have any outside planning assistance, and what kind of planning assistance could you use in a future disaster? Um, So I think APA has a a very important role to play in uh, post-disaster housing, and I would I would argue that assistance ought to be uh, provided in the same way that we seek to provide assistance to neighborhoods. Uh, Civically engaged homeowners associations, resident associations, tenant unions, and the like ought to be the the client for engaging in remediation and analysis of community needs after disasters. I think there's a there's a natural tendency to sort of assume that government is going to hire a fleet of planners and they're going to go out and do assessments, and hopefully they do. But ultimately, the people who are most concerned about the recovery and most concerned about the equity about equity in the recovery, um, those are people who actually live in the neighborhood, and they are usually the ones who are most excluded from the. Uh, from the planning process, most in need of information. They're the most, in our opinion, they're the most important voice um, that needs to be present in determining, um, you know, strategies. Are we going to do like Houston's doing a mandatory homeowner financed elevation program, or are we going to do mitigation, public infrastructure mitigation activities where people don't have the money to do it? Well, you know the. Left to its own, the government will do whatever is best for the government. But, uh, you know, I think that planning needs to happen at the neighborhood level, and I think that the the residents need to be uh, empowered to make those choices. I also think that, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a big believer in the notion that neighborhood-type planning is like some of the real basic building blocks of democracy. 
I, I talked earlier about how I think the individual homeowner needs agency in the rebuilding of their home. But um, we also need to be focused on building not just physical infrastructure in neighborhoods, but social infrastructure within neighborhoods. That is to say, institutions of people working together to define what's going to make their community and their neighborhood livable, what's going to make it a good place for them, a place they can succeed. And unless people have, unless people have the, the tools to engage in that type of planning process, they're sort of relegated to kind of pro forma efforts on the part of public participation processes that are for regional disaster recovery and a whole lot of other things. There is so much that has gone wrong. There is so much legacy of Jim Crow disinvestment and racism that has produced the extreme vulnerability of low-income neighborhoods that suffer from disasters. With the unprecedented amount of money that comes available for the rebuilding process, there is an opportunity to undo a good portion of that disinvestment and exclusion. And it's not just physical disinvestment, it's civic disinvestment, it's social disinvestment. It's where City Hall tells people this is what is good for you in this neighborhood, and this is what we're going to do. Disaster recovery, uh, you know, it, it's a terrible situation that you get into to do it, but there is this opportunity to, to instill, to support, to, to prop up this social infrastructure of civic engagement and, and self-determination. Uh, and, you know, it's what gets me up every day, and it's what gets my staff really excited about the work that they get to do. When we get to support uh, a neighborhood, you know, that's been devastated, but when when people feel like, I'm going to have a say in this, we're going to be down at City Hall, we're going to be speaking out about how we want this recovery to work for us, that's what it's all about. Well, I, for one, would love to see uh, you take this discussion in Planning Magazine has a, an opinion section, and it sounds like this discussion needs to be made not only for those of us that are in the hazard mitigation and disaster recovery area, but basically for planners at large. Uh, you know, planners have the skills that com the community needs in order to do these things. Getting the government to support the planners' work to do this is the real trick. You know, I guess some of my cynicism flows from the fact that politicians often get hold of this disaster recovery money and, in essence, want to prove that they can administer this efficiently and effectively, and um, it, it seldom works out that way. But uh, they often scorn the role of planners. They often scorn the activity of planning as something that is sort of superfluous and takes up too much time and too much effort and slows the disaster recovery process down. Nothing could be further from the truth because, in essence, when there isn't planning, when we fail to take an uh, advantage of the opportunity to give people the agency to do the restorative type of work for their neighborhoods, then we end up building back the same patterns of segregation and inequality and uh, environmental vulnerability uh, that existed before the disaster. And the notion that we would take $10 billion and rebuild Jim Crow and rebuild the same level of vulnerability, which in, in fact in Texas we're doing today, uh, is, a, uh, is a true travesty. Uh, we're getting to the end where we're beginning to close out. And the one question... I'm not sure that there really is an answer, but I'll ask it anyways. Uh, it sounds like you've got experience with a lot of hurricanes. And the question was going to be, what do you know now that you wish you had known before the hurricane? But uh, it sounds like you've had this reinforced many times. I think it's, I, I, again, I think it's three things. I think 
the disaster recovery process takes too long. Uh, there are financial inefficiencies in the process, and we don't give survivors and communities the agency to rebuild in a better way. To me, those are the three lessons that I've learned over the years. Do you see any opportunities in the near future as the communities continue to recover? Yeah, I mean, I, I to me, the, there are examples of where each of these problems has been overcome or people are trying to work to overcome them. The problem is, is that at the state administrative level, at HUD and at FEMA, the, the emphasis is on uh, sort of managing the recovery process as opposed to making the recovery process ha have the best possible outcome it can have for people. And uh, so there are shining lights out there of, of ways that uh, things could and should work. Uh, but unfortunately, control over these programs has a tendency to be consolidated in FEMA headquarters, HUD headquarters, and the governor's office. And uh, they're just managers. They, they don't have a vision. They don't have a plan. They don't have, uh, they don't have a mission to fundamentally make things substantially better than they were. All anybody's trying to do is to manage a bunch of money and to uh, manage a process to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. And the, the, the bar is too low. It sounds like you would be encouraging more a, of a block grant to the local communities. Then. Well, I think, I think a block grant can be, uh, uh, block grants can be good or block grants can be misused. I, I do think that, um, I believe that there needs to be, you know, in Texas, the, the governor's got a mantra about local control, but what local control means is that the mayor or the county judge is going to make the decisions on how the disaster recovery program works within the context of a bunch of rules that are handed down by the federal agencies and the governor's office and imposed on them. You know, I would go lower than all of that. I really think that disaster planning and disaster mitigation is ought to be ought to be community and neighborhood level as opposed to city, county and state level. And it's it's hard for government to do that because it's not used to engaging a community level constituency and and to in, involve them. Again, I think that's a role where APA and planners who've thought about the notion of engaging community can can perhaps develop some systems or another way to do this. I haven't thought this out completely as to exactly how it would work, um, except in the you know in the few communities that we are able to work with. We're beginning to see a number of webinars coming out on community engagement, so perhaps this will help. Yeah, yeah, and it's more than engagement. It's, you know, because I think that, uh, you know, community participation and community engagement are sort of checkboxes for um, government block grant planning processes. You know, the government will develop a plan, we'll post it for 14 days, we'll take it public input, Maybe we'll hold a public hearing, and then we'll go do what we plan to do. And that's not what I'm talking about. And with that, we're at the end. Uh, can you tell us where we can find more about your organization online and any resources you'd like our listeners to know about? Well, our website, uh, and we have a pretty active blog where we've got all of our recommendations, our four rights of disaster survivors, seven principles of disaster recovery, and 60 detailed disaster initiatives. All of that can be found as, as well as updates on disaster recovery issues over the years at the website Texas Housers, that's T-E-X-A-S-H-O-U-S-E-R-S dot O-R-G. And uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm relatively active on um, on Twitter on these issues and uh, my handle is John H underscore T X Housers. And with that, I believe we are done. I know I'm going to look at your uh, website and look at that, and 
hopefully a lot of the information is applicable outside of Texas also. Well, thanks so much, and uh, hopefully uh, all the planners out there will uh, will rise up and help help engage the community to actually have some agency in uh, disaster recovery. I can't think of anything more important in the community development field right now. I totally agree. Thank you, John, for being on the uh, podcast. We really appreciate it. It is great talking to you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the American Planning Association podcast. For resources on hazard mitigation and disaster recovery, visit planning.org slash resilience. To hear past episodes of the APA podcast, visit planning.org slash podcast. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Have an idea for a podcast series? Send it to podcast at planning.org.